Yeah, man, I wanted to see that picture again of Pastor Dave. Uh, <laughs> that looks like Craig. Craig could look like that, Jessica. I've seen him lift before those weights. Oh, my goodness. Psalm 23. Why don't you turn to Psalm 23? The spiritual is always our greatest need. It's a relationship with Christ. I agree, Pastor Dave. So true. So true. In Psalm 23, how many have ever been to a funeral? I know you've been to a funeral before and heard this passage read, Psalm 23. Let me see your hand. Psalm 23. And I know I've used it a lot myself over the years, a lot. But unfortunately, don't let familiarity breed contempt this morning. Um, we're going to talk about it. There's so much that's applicable here. Last week, we talked about Jesus. He's our Savior. That is our greatest need, is to be made right with God, to know Jesus. If you were to go to Psalm 22, you see, these are the, the Psalters. Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24. Tucked in the middle of 22 and 24, obviously, is 23. Psalm 22 talks about the fact that he gave his life for us. He's the good shepherd. In John 10, you'd see that. That he laid down his life for the sheep. He laid it down. He is our Savior. Thank God he's our Savior. Aren't you glad? And if you don't know him as your Savior, you need to come to know we beg of you. We'd love to see you. We would rejoice with you like the angels in heaven that the Bible says rejoices over even just one sinner who repents. He's the good shepherd. That's Psalm 22. You'd see that. Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 24. And we got that part down, by the way. Maybe you had that here. Most of you do. I'm saved and I know it. I know Jesus is my Savior. I'm covered. I'm ready to meet him. And then you may go to Psalm 24, which talks about he's the chief shepherd. One day we're going to see him. He's taken us home to heaven. How many of you sung those songs, those old hymns? I've got a what? Just over the hilltop? Okay. A few of you have sung that before. I've got a mansion just over the... I sing it all the time because at the nursing home, we got a bunch of old folks who I love. We love each other, and they have sung that song till the cows come home. I've got a mansion, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. And some of the young people look at me like, you're messed up. <laughs> I've never even heard of that song before. Don't know what you're talking about. It's okay. I love the new songs. I love the hymns. I love that about amazing grace. And we know about that. Yes, we know he's taken us to heaven. But the problem, one of the challenges that we face is what's in the middle. Here's the life we're living right now. Psalm 23. And you might think, what does that have to do with anything? We're talking about a psalm about shepherd and sheep. Well, if you can, quote it with me. Let's try it, okay? Unfortunately, I don't have it memorized in the NIV, but I have it memorized in the King James, at least most of it. We'll see. I'm getting old. So I may look back to the Scripture. Feel free to look at the Scripture, but Psalm 23 are up on the screen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Did I forget a verse? Did I forget a verse? Yes. You prepare a table before me, where? In the presence of mine enemies, right? My cup runneth over. It's a great psalm. Don't let the familiarity of it cause you to fall asleep this morning. I want you to meditate on it through the week, this coming week. Check it out. Now, you might say again, what's the relevance of this? I don't have any sheep. I don't know much about sheep. I don't even know much about shepherds other than what I've read from the Scripture and what I've read in a book. Now, how many of you ever shepherd sheep or ever been around sheep? A few of you. Great. You can correct me if I say something wrong. Just jump in there somewhere, okay? Feel free, brother. All right? 
<laughs> Thanks. All right. You might think, how about if we heard the Lord is my mechanic and he keeps me in repair? You might say, I'd like to hear about that one. That's not what we're talking about here. It's similar. That's our modern application possibly. But to an Israelite shepherd, sheep are not machines. So it doesn't make sense, okay? There's enough relevancy in Psalm 23 that will be all right. It's a great psalm because it talks about King David sharing about his personal faith with Jesus Christ. It's about a relationship. He's putting his trust in the shepherd, in God himself, who is a good shepherd. He's a personal God who relates to us. The very first verse says, the Lord is my shepherd. It begins with who? The Lord. Who does it end with? Look in verse 6. I will dwell in the house of who? The Lord forever. Everything in between. God's got it covered from the beginning to the end and everything in between. So we must learn to trust our shepherd. What is this word shepherd? Now we know when it says Lord, capital L, capital O, R, D. It's Jehovah. It's Yahweh. Okay? He is the self-existent one. He's above everything. He's a good and gracious and holy God. But he says, the Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd. What does that mean, shepherd? What's that referring to? Well, it means rohi. Pastor Dave and I were talking about that, how you pronounce some of these names. It's not like I go around every day pronouncing some of the names of God. But rohi. The Lord is my rohi. He's my shepherd. What, is, what do you think that means? What does a shepherd do? Because we're going to see the relevance of it. A shepherd tends the flock. A shepherd guides the flock. He pastures the flock. That means he feeds it. He cares for it. He shepherds it. They're his care. He watches over everything they do. He prepares the place where they go. If you were to go to Ezekiel chapter 34, a great definition. Again, it says he heals. He binds up the wounds. He cares for the sheep. He tends them. He protects them. He guides them. Ezekiel 34, if you want to check that out later. I'm not going to go to that passage this morning. But again, Psalm 23 is a great passage of Scripture. A woman talked to her pastor, and she says, what does it really mean to trust God as our shepherd? Because that's what this passage, a lot of it's saying, that we need to learn to rest and trust in him. Pastor Dave started off this morning saying, how many of you have any control issues or like to be in control? I was surprised there wasn't more hands. Think about the areas of your life where you still have control. You may not call yourself a control freak, but don't you have areas of your life that you want to still hold on to? Come on, be honest. I don't want to let some things go, even though it hasn't helped me in the past. I know I need to let it go and cling to God as my shepherd, but there's still those areas that I don't want to let go. That's control issues. If everybody's honest, you have some to some degree. Some are more open than others. I have one boy who would, he just, he had, he just wouldn't let go. I was very similar. Anytime you came to swimming, I hated it. I hated going to swimming classes. I never made it to the shark level, whatever it is, tortoise. <laughs> you, had a, you know, and then back, what is it on your back? When you're swimming on your back, what do you call that? Backstroke. backstroke. Thanks, brother. I told you I hated swimming, except that going to the beach, just being in the water. I did not want to let my feet go up. I did not. You know, just lay back, rest. I got you, my hands underneath you, the instructor. I didn't care. I just wanted to go right back down and fight it all. Fight it. You got to let go. You got to trust. And this lady says, I don't know how to trust him. And he said, did you learn to float? She said, well, I've tried to. And he drove home his point. And he said, that's the crux of the issue right there. Isn't that exactly the reason why you did not succeed? It's because... You are not letting the water bear you up. You're fighting it the entire time. Water will do its part if you what? If you let it, it'll buoy you. Trusting the Lord may sound easy. The Lord is my shepherd. Oh, yeah, he'll care for me. I know he loves me. He's a good God. Oh, yeah. But do we really let him have his way? Do we really let him direct our paths, as we'll look at a little bit here this morning? Do we really trust him? Because it isn't easy when you begin to try to trust him. 
with life circumstances. It's very difficult sometimes. And I know because I've been there. And so have you probably. <laughs> I remember trying over and over again over the years. Lord, I want to be holy. Lord, I want to love you even more. Lord, I want to conquer this thing in my life. Lord, I want to be able to be the kind of worshiper who worships you in spirit and in truth. I don't want to just come to church. I don't want to just go through life existing. Status quo. Anybody like status quo? It can be comfortable. When you go to work, you hope that nobody asks you to do something that's unusual or change, possibly. Some of you might love change. Usually people say the only person that likes change is a baby with a wet diaper. Most of us don't like change. Well, God's going to shake it up sometimes so that you will depend upon him. Because sheep, I've been told, are dumber than a box of rocks. They're dumb, right? I was told that sometimes a sheep, if it breaks off, it starts walking around in a circle. Another sheep might follow that, and then another sheep will start to follow it. Even though it's not going anywhere, anywhere, it'll walk around in circles, going nowhere. They're dumb, and they wander, and that's why they need the shepherd. Well, huh, thank God for the fact that he is the good shepherd. He's the chief shepherd in Psalm 23, Hebrews also, chapter 13 talks about he's the chief shepherd. He'll help equip you. You remember the study in Hebrews? He strengthens us for the journey. He matures us. That's what the shepherd wants to do. Not only does he help heal the sheep and care for the sheep, but ultimately as us as his sheep, he wants us to mature and develop as well. Not only is he the good shepherd, he's also a great shepherd and the chief shepherd. He is present right now. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd right now. Is he your shepherd? In your daily living, does he supply your needs? Are you letting him meet your needs? How do you know if you're one of his sheep? How would you know if you're one of his sheep? Do you want to be in his sheepfold? Because in John 10, he talks about there's some sheep who are not a part of that fold. They're not in. They're not one of the shepherds. They don't belong to the shepherd. How do you know if you really belong? to the King of kings and Lord of lords, the chief shepherd. Well, John 10, 27 says, they listen to my word, they hear my voice, they know me. Are you listening to his word? Do you desire to know his word? Are you listening? Do you hear it? Do you know when there's lies? A lot of times, I guarantee you, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a true Christian, when you hear some teaching, whether on TV, or you hear somebody talking at work, Red flag comes up. Something's not right. That's the Spirit of God speaking to you. Okay? Jesus is the truth. He, not just, he doesn't just tell you the truth. He is the truth. And when you know Jesus and he lives in you and the Spirit of God lives in you, red flag comes up because it flies against, it just smacks against the truth. And so you'll know the truth, number one. Two, Jesus said, they follow me. My sheep, follow me. Are you following him today? Are you walking with him? Do you really know him? Again, I, it is our greatest need. It's a spiritual need. I heard somebody saying the other day about the Lord is my shepherd. We need our soul restored. If you're here today, or those who don't know Christ as Savior, they need their soul restored. Gospel says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world? But what? loses his soul loses his own soul because he's not right with God he's not been forgiven of his sin he's not repented of his sin we need to fall at the foot of the cross we need to fall at the mercies of Jesus Christ and say have mercy on me I'm a sinner I repent of my sin and I receive you as my Lord and Savior save me today Jesus that is the greatest need and we know that you may have that covered and most of you do and that's a good thing share that message but there are also, here's another problem today, is I shall not want. Is that true for you? <laughs> That's a major problem today is the dissatisfaction of the heart in our world today. And oftentimes even in believers, but especially among unbelievers. The president at Harvard University was asked, what's the greatest problem among students at the university that he's seen over the years, year after year? You know what his response was? Emptiness emptiness 
And unfulfillment is some of the greatest thing, or a lack of fulfillment in their lives. No purpose, no compass, no guide, no direction. I remember when I was at Baldwin Wallace, two of our kids went to Baldwin Wallace. We were playing ping pong in this one room and there was a board there that, that people could write on that board anything they wanted to write. I saw some things about suicide, about sexual abuse, just about the soul, loneliness, and lack of fulfillment. What's my purpose for living? Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? On and I, I was almost in tears that day of orientation. And I thought, Lord, help my son, because I know this is a mission field. I know there's a lot of unbelievers at this school, but there's unbelievers everywhere. We need to know that our soul is restored, that we're right with God, but he also offers peace and hope. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or as the NIV says, I lack nothing. I lack nothing. So, verse 1. Have you ever complained? You say, yeah, I know, I lack nothing. I have everything I want. Here's some more um, translations. I shall never be deficient. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall never be deficient. The Lord is my shepherd, I have what I need. One little girl, I probably shared it before with you, when she was quoting this to her mother, she said, the Lord is my shepherd, what more shall I want? Isn't that true? She misquoted it, but she was dead on on the actual meeting. There is nothing that you or I really need. Everything is taken care of in Jesus Christ as far as the things that are most important. And the most important is what? The spiritual. Do you want to know why people are searching for so much? Even believers sometimes, they should know better. But I've been there too. I went seeking for something else even though I knew that my Savior and Him was all that I need. We used to sing a song at Cedarville College. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. Oh, oh. The president would be going like this. He, could, he didn't sing a whole lot, but he'd take his hand up. Point is, I never forgot that song. Yes, Christ is all I need. How many would you say, Christ is all I need? But is he really, really your total fulfillment? Are you searching for something else? Have you ever done that before? And I'm sad to say that I have. And it did not help. It was discouraging. I'm telling you, we know it. We say we have all we want. I lack nothing. God knows how to meet every spiritual need. And by the way, Matthew 6 says, he'll take care of the basic practical needs that you have. He's not the candy man. Stick in your quarter, your 50 cents, and get out whatever you want. I've had people have asked me at work, and I'm grateful they asked me for prayer, but there's some who don't know the Lord. And there's some who do, and they're asking for prayer. They're asking that the good shepherd would, would help them in their lives and answer their prayers. But they're not even living rightly with God. Some of them don't even know God. Why would God bless a Christian if he's not living right with him, and yet you're saying, I've been asking him for help. But you're living in disobedience, and you know it. If we don't align ourselves under his promises and under his lordship, why would he answer my prayer or your prayer? That would be, he'd be enabling us in our sinful behavior. You see, he's more concerned about who you become in him, your identity in Jesus Christ, not just that you get your prayers answered. Prayer is ultimately about a relationship with him, and I'm learning that more and more. It's not just what I get, although I pray for those things too. I pray for my wife. I pray for our relationship. I pray for even a stronger marriage. I pray that God would use us here in this church and we'd grow in relationships with one another. Yes, I pray all those things, but... First and foremost, how are you doing with the shepherd? Do you really know him? He knows you. He loves you if you're a child of God. And he wants you to count on him. He wants you to depend upon him. Quit bleeding around, pun intended, all over the place rather than looking to your shepherd who is the good shepherd. He loves you. Huh. The Israelites walked around in unbelief. Well, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Found that interesting. The sheep, he would go around and prepare the sheep. Some sheep would wander. Some needed to have their legs broken. Did you know that? Because they'd get off into trouble. Some would go off a cliff. That's at times why he would use this. I actually had somebody at work 
buy me this at the fairground. I thought that'd be cool to have one of those. It's kind of neat. You know what this is, don't you? It's not a cane. I had a couple at work say, Pastor Kirk, that cane's a little bit long for you. That's a, that's a crook. It's a staff. It's a staff. And they would use this on a regular basis for a lot of different reasons. They could also help protect and save the sheep if it was falling. Could grab a hold of its leg and help it in various ways. And so that was one of the things, if we get to that today, we'll see. We may or may not. <laughs> uh, I got to tell you, he makes you lie down. Has he ever broken you? He may not have broken your leg, literally. But have you ever been laid up? You ever been so discouraged that God got a hold of your attention? He makes you lie down. He'll do what he's got to do to grab your attention. Not because he hates you, but because he loves you. He wants you to know him and to love him and to worship him. It's not all about us. It's about him, the good shepherd. And yet he loves us. And the sooner we realize how he loves us and he cares for us, the sooner you will continue to grow and mature. My kids hated nap time. How about your kids? They're little. Did you know? You know your kids need to sleep. They are getting so whiny, right? They need a nap. Nap time, buster. You need some energy. You don't even realize it. And they would fight you, right? But you'd put them down. You'd make them take a nap. At least we did a few times, right? I know Donna couldn't wait. <laughs> Gave her a little R&R. &R. I was usually at work. Um, <clears throat> and even though they fought us, when they woke up from that nap, a transformation had occurred. Slightly, anyway. They woke up with some energy. They woke up in a little bit better mood, maybe not quite as whiny. You see, God knows. Whining doesn't help. Complaining doesn't help. We say we lack nothing. We say he is our shepherd. Yes, you're my all in all. But we still need help. We need him to intervene. And a good shepherd does. The good shepherd pursues. He cares. He goes ahead. And he leads and he guides. He makes them lie down in green pastures. He finds it. He scopes it out. He doesn't want them eating from grass. The good shepherd would take them to locations that were good grass. Watch out for them. He leads me beside still waters or quiet waters. Sheep will not go. They will not go to a place where there is a raging river. You know why? Because they're not the most balanced. I mean, talk, think about your sports teams. Anybody want to be called their emblem or their sports uh, sheep? We see tigers. We see lions. You know, kids, when they want, what kind of animals they want to be? I've never heard most say, I want to be a sheep. <laughs> they're not athletic. They're dumb. You know, they just... Yeah, and they made the dumbest noise. It's crazy. Sheep. Okay, I'm sorry. If you have sheep, I hope I didn't offend anybody in here. God loves all the little animals. He has the little sheep too. Listen, the sheep, if he, they will not drink by a raging water because they lose balance. And all the fur, all the, uh, what is that stuff called in there? The wool, thank you. Yeah, Fur. I know you wanted to laugh. I don't know why you didn't. <clears throat> Thank you, Jane. The wool. If there's so much wool, if they fall in, it could be their death. Or it could gravely hurt them. Um, and they have a hard time getting back up. In fact, many times they say, once a, sh a sheep gets on its back, it needs help getting back up. That's why the sheep will go around and always examine and check out the flock. He'll use this many times to examine them and check them out. And even when they come in, make sure he's got them all, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. If one's missing, what's he do? He'll get somebody to watch his sheep because that's what somebody does, right? It's like at the job. If you go off the machine, CNC machine or whatever you're at workplace, hopefully you find somebody to help watch your machine while you go off to do something else. That's just good leadership. You have somebody cover your shift. That's good leadership. Well, the shepherd does the same thing. And they need the shepherd what he'll do is he'll dam it up so that it's, a, it's a, um, a calm waters, calm waters. And the sheep don't lose their balance. They feel safe, and then they'll drink. God does that in our lives, doesn't he? He may break us. It's been said that God will not greatly use you until you've been broken. Remember Psalm 51 or Psalm 50? It says a broken and contrite heart. 
he will not despise. God loves you. And that's when we seem to listen and pay attention that much more. And we really see that he does love us and he has a plan for us. He guides us along the right paths as well. And uh, I love that. He guides us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Uh, God guides us. He has a plan for us. One of the things, again, he does, interesting, to feed the sheep. Sometimes he'll walk and the sheep are behind him. He'll grab up, he'll pull down some fruit from a tree, and he will take that piece of fruit that he knows the sheep like and hang it back here and walk where he needs to go with the sheep. Guess what they do? You know, they're all excited. <laughs> I don't know what else they do. <laughs> but they'll go behind that. Seriously, this is what they'll do. Uh, and they will begin to eat what he has in his hand. And they'll get in real close as they can, all packed in together. And they will follow and eat while he leads them. He leads them while he feeds them, and he feeds them while he leads them. Isn't that cool? How does God feed us? You say, okay, enough about sheep. There's so many principles in here. We won't have time to get through it all. He feeds us through what? The Word. The Word of God. Sanctify them by thy Word, Jesus said. Thy truth. You have to continue in His Word. The book of John says, continue in His Word. And if you continue and abide in Jesus and abide in His Word and continue in His Word and your heart's desire is to thirst and hunger for righteousness, He'll lead you in paths of righteousness. He will. And the truth when you continue in it and you desire to follow what he says to do. You listen and you follow. The truth shall do what? Say it again. Set you free. Boy, he's a good God. He's a good shepherd. He cares for us. <laughs> he restores my soul. Anybody need soul restoration? <laughs> I can think of at least three people in Scripture. David. Jonah and Peter all blew it. David committed adultery. Did God pursue him or did he give him up? Did he pursue him? Who did he use? Nathan. God used Nathan. Boy, talk about working behind the scenes. David didn't even see it coming. He wasn't even looking for it. It had been at least a year, scholars say, that he had, been in, he had not repented. He was in sin after that sin of sexual morality with Bathsheba committed uh, an adultery. Nathan said, you're the man. You're the man. God said, you know, it's interesting to me. God said, David, if that had been too little, I'd given you all these things. I'd given you wives. I'd given you a place. I'd given you a position. I'd given you my love. If that had been too little, I'd have given you even more. More in the sense of more that God knows whatever it is that we need for that spiritual fulfillment. Because that's really the issue is your heart of hearts. That's why it's so important that we worship him. That's why it's so important that we come here on a regular basis and throughout the week that you get in the Word of God. That's why he's so important. Pastor Dave's desire is to preach expositionally from the Word of God. This is the food. Amen. This is where we grow and worshiping together by the Spirit of God. We need each other. The sheep that gets off by itself meh, is in trouble. It's in trouble. I've needed soul restoration. Peter got away. I'll never deny you. Boy, did he. But he repented right? He repented. And Jesus later said, it's not too late. Peter, I'm going to use you. You're going to be the foundation. You're going to be, other than, oh, Jesus Christ is the foundation, but I'm going to use you to help build the church. What did he tell Peter? Feed my sheep. He was used as a great leader. Do you know he wants to use you too? Dads, be the spiritual leader in your home. Both mom and dad are obviously very important. What workplace? People need to hear from the Word. I just heard somebody give a statement. What's the Word? Somebody at work today. What's the good Word? That's an old expression. I've heard that in ages. Do you have a good Word to share with a world who needs Jesus Christ? A world who desperately has no hope, who has no fulfillment because they don't, they're not connected to the Good Shepherd. We are. That's why it's so important that we spend time with Him and in His Word. Hmm. Paths of righteousness, he will lead us. 
Oh, boy. He will guide you, by the way. Remember this real quick. Bags. B-A-G-S. Say bags. Bags. B-A-G-S. I'm not talking about grocery bags. I know you're starting to get hungry. Bags. God will give you direction. He will lead you in paths of righteousness. But, again, not if you are walking in outright disobedience. If you're asking God, show me where you want me to go. It's not in Scripture. Whether you're supposed to take this job or that job. Or you're supposed to marry this person or that person. It doesn't say those things, but he gives you principles and he leads you. He wants you to look to him for guidance and direction. But bags is something that's pretty cool. Just saw this uh, recently. First one is believe. People say, what's God's will? Well, it's the basic, flat-out, clear-cut. Here's some four things. There might be more. Here's four things. You have to do his basic will. You have to do exactly what he wants you to do, what he commands you to do. The first one is B. What is B? John 640. What is God's will, it says? This is my Father's will that all look to the Son and believe in Him, and they shall have eternal life, and He will raise them up in the end. Believe. Do you know Christ is your Savior, and are you trusting Him? Believe. A. This is flat out clear cut. Avoid sexual immorality. Be sanctified, it says, and in, in, uh, uh, that is 1 uh, Thessalonians 4 3. Be sanctified, it says, which means grow in your faith. But then it says, avoid sexual immorality. That's clear-cut in Scripture. That's the will of God. It says it very clearly there. Third thing, G, give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. This is the will of God that you in all things give thanks. How many people do you know complain? How many are never thankful about anything? We live in an unthankful society, right? Here's the fourth one. And I'm not trying to minimize or simplify or simplify, but those are four things that are clearly God's will. And he's not going to show you everything else or what's not in Scripture unless we are following what is clearly laid out in Scripture. And here's the fourth one. It's S, bags. Submit to doing what is right. 1 Peter 2.15. 1 Peter 2.15. It says that we are to do good. Or we are to do what is right. And I want to tell you, when you do that, God will direct you. I don't know when, but he will. Bert just asked, he'd been asking for prayer um, about a, pos- a potential position, opportunity, either in Ashland or in Cleveland. Both cool, really cool. And uh, without going into too much detail, I, I just, I heard his heart. I heard his desire. I know he loves the Lord. I know he's trying to honor the Lord in his life based on our conversations we've had. And he just said, I'd just like you to pray for me. So it's a privilege. I know many others are praying for him too. But um, when you follow these four things, bags, and I see that in his life, I see a hunger for Christ. Guess what? God gave him a peace. He thought it might be this one direction, but he gave him the peace to the other. And because he was concerned about the environment, he was concerned also about the people he'd be working with, right? Right? concerned about the spiritual aspect of the fellowship and you just felt the peace of God in that one location I want to tell you is it any wonder why God directed him to that place and revealed to him God will reveal to you what his will is if you follow him in obedience it's not about all these other things first and foremost it's about him first and foremost and when your heart is right with him when you're allowing him to develop you it's not the answers to prayer first and foremost about those things it's about the character development and maturing in your faith It's not just the right place, but the right kind of life. The right kind of life. And that life is following the good shepherd. And he will direct you what the Father's will is. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. That's the veil of deep darkness. Some scholars say that's actual death. Well, we don't have to be afraid of death, right? Uh, I'm not looking forward to how I might die, but we don't have to be afraid of death. When you know Christ is Savior, because he rose, we too will rise. But many others suggest that this is actually the valley of dark, deep darkness. We've all been through those, right? I love to be on a mountaintop experience. But to get from one mountaintop to the next, what do you have to go through? What's in between the two mountaintops? The valleys. I hate the valleys. I hate the darkness. I hate the hard times. I hate the discouragement. And in those sheep, the shepherd would know what's around. You know what was around? 
wild critters. I hear coyotes out in my backyard where we live now, out in the country. I don't usually go wander outside in the back of my neighbor's backyard when that happens, but the shepherd knows all the wild animals that are around. Um, In fact, the matter goes on to say, I'll fear no evil for you are with me. Do you realize when he says, I will anoint you with oil? I'll anoint your head with oil. Oftentimes, out in those places where they would wander, we would give them good food, there were little holes. You know what's in those holes? A nasty critter. Vipers. The shepherd knew where most of those places were, or he'd scope it out. Do you know what he would put around the ring of that hole? Oil. It was almost like a repellent. And then he'd put it on the shepherds, or on the sheep as well. Acted like a repellent. So when that viper would go up the hole, try to go up the hole, guess what would happen? Slide back down. Because it was too slippery. That oil acted as a preventative measure, keeping the sheep from being uh, bit, poisoned. Because if they did, if they got bit, they would pop up out of the holes at times and get the sheep. And enough that it might kill it, or at least maim it. The shepherd would go around and protect. Isn't that something? You don't mess with snakes. I'm not pulling the wool over you. (laughs) True story. (laughs) A little cheesy, yeah? John 10. We have an enemy. He does not want you restored. He does not want you enjoying a relationship with him. John 10 says the thief. Now, many suggest that could be the Pharisees and the false teaching. False teaching is ugly. It'll destroy you. But you know who else I believe could be the thief? Satan. The thief comes to do what? Steal, kill, and what? Destroy. He wants to maim you. He wants to keep you ineffective. Listen, if we wander and get off all on our own and don't trust the shepherd, you're going to pay a price for it. And over the years I have, anytime I wandered from God and his word, stop following him, stop listening to him, you get in trouble. You get bit, you get hurt, and you wander. Listen, he'll comfort you. He'll bring healing to you. He says he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He protects, he cares for us. Even out in the middle of the field, he would try to find a flat area of the shepherd. Pull out a cloth out of his belt and lay out some food for the sheep and and care for them. He knows what we need. When you feel like you're out in the desert, when you're not sure what, what tomorrow holds, when you're not sure about your health, he knows in the midst of the valleys, in the deep valleys, in the darkness, he comes to you. He pursues you. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and love or goodness and mercy are like two sheepdogs. You know what sheepdogs would do? They'd go behind the sheep and they would help corral them and guide them in the right way where they needed to go, where the shepherd wanted them to go. Had them trained. Be right behind them, following them. Making sure they go to the right place. You know, God is the same way. His goodness and mercy. This is what's similar is Romans 8, 28 in the New Testament. Almost like a similar passage. <laughs> we know that all things work together for the good. Here it says, surely your goodness. All things work together for the good to those who love God. Do you love him? Is your heart completely his? He will direct you. He will guide you. And he's doing it all bringing things together, taking even the messes of our lives and turning into a message to mature you, to develop you, to help you to love him. That's what he wants. And David's desire was to worship him. I don't know if this is talking about heaven. Some say it is. Some say this last verse, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, suggests that it's talking about the temple because the temple represented where they go to worship. But is that the only place where God wants us to worship? I think it's wherever heaven is, it's where God is in the third heavens. And I believe in a real heaven. I believe in the millennial kingdom. But the real issue is it's in the presence of Jesus. That's why when you're at work, that's why you're in home, wherever you are, you are to worship him right where you are. And that was David's desire. I desire to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's not so much about where 
he'd be in the future? <laughs> but with whom he'd be? He wants you. He wants a closer walk with you. All the way, an old hymn, all the way my Savior leads me. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? I know Jesus does all things well. He guides and he directs and he cares. Father, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your amazing grace. I thank you that you are the good shepherd who loves us, who cares for us, who leads and directs us. Oh, Lord, you heal us. You anoint us with your presence and your spirit. It's like a shepherd with the sheep, the oil, cares for those wounded areas of our lives. And we've all been wounded. We've been attacked by the evil one. We've been bit by the snake of all snakes, the devil, who desires to keep us ineffective in our walk with you. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to follow you. May we not think we're so smart that we got this thing all figured out. Lord, to help us to trust you, to follow you, submit to you, depend upon you, run into your arms as the good shepherd and the chief shepherd that you are. Bring healing to our lives. Restore us. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Oh, Lord God. Cleanse us from any sin. Renew us in our faith. And we thank you that you pursue us, that goodness and mercy. Like those sheepdogs, you actively pursue us every day. And it's not just when we get to heaven, it's all the days, the scripture says. All the days, that's today of our life, we can dwell with you and experience the Spirit of God changing us and transforming us. We're grateful. We love you. We need you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.